Welcome to the Market Mystics Podcast. I'm Joshua. I'm Kim. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, We have, we're like kicking season three off with a bang. We have a super special guest today. Josh, do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. So today we have like the immense honor to be joined by Chris Blackaby. Um, And many of you, many of our listeners are probably familiar with his name, but if you're not, I think you're in for a treat. Um, Chris has been a name that has been around for a little while and then took a little bit of a break and now is back doing some really fun stuff. I know he's current, he's getting ready to do some conferences with one of our former guests, Tommy Miller. And so that'll be really exciting, but welcome to the show, Chris. Hi guys. Thank you very much. And very honored to be here. Awesome. We're glad to have you here. I have to tell you something. This is, this is really interesting. Um, probably if I had to guess probably half of our guests from season two, mm-hmm. uh, name dropped you in one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think in a creepy way, just in like a very relational way. <laughs> yeah. And so I feel like we've kind of been building up to this. And so we're super excited to have you with us. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say my friend, Chris Blackaby, like that's, and I think that that is, that's gotta be like, that's an honor in and of itself that just the majority of the people we talk to are yeah. like, oh, this is my friend. Like not even just, oh, have you heard of this random person? Right. But like, this is my friend. Yeah. I'm very fortunate to, um, in the late nineties, early two thousands, I belonged to a church planning group from out of South Africa, who your South African friends would know. And they were very relationally orientated. Like we know each other as friends first. So there was no titles like, um, the pastors, uh, was, was a function. And the elders was a function, and but you knew everyone by their first name, and you could walk up to the guy who led the whole thing. He maybe had maybe two thousand churches he's looking after. But you could walk up to him and talk to him, use his first name, like there were no titles, and so we knew each other. And um, that church, as it was, has dissolved in the form that it was, but even like twenty years later. All those people still talk to each other. We see each other. We meet up. All the leaders of that church still hang out, even though the church is pretty much gone. Mm-hmm. They all catch up and, and the kids catch up. And so I, I very fortunately came from a highly relational church. They kept this relationship even when it reached a 1,000 people, which is quite amazing. And uh, so uh, with all the people in my sphere, we're all friends. We text each other. And, you know, we look after each other's kids and um, birthdays and, you know. So you had Arun on the other day, yeah? Mm -hmm. Arun Bolchandani. So I went to Arun's uh, house to see him because in California. So I went to see him. And then, but his wife, Carlisle, couldn't be there. So um, I I bought her some gifts (laughs) and left them there. So when she comes back, she had to unfortunately be the family matter and so we're all friends and look after each other yeah it's it's really good it's very healthy it's what's going to be needed in the future yeah mm. I love that Chris I have to tell you one of the things that uh Josh and I have been so drawn to I mean just in our business and in the ministry that we do and in the travels that we do, one of the biggest things the Lord has been leading us to is community. Every, like everything has had to start from community. There's no like building some business plan first. It always has started with community. And I love that. And I, I tend to think that's, you know, that's his heart for us. And I guess I'm just really encouraged to know that that's how you operate too. You know what I mean? And I think there is something Mm. special in kind of this mystic movement, if that's what we're calling it. I don't even know what you would call it. Um, this Christian mystic movement, 
That's the title for now. <laughs> um, and I think so much of it is relational and it feels so much, I don't know, it feels so much closer to his heart, I feel like, you know? Yeah. I've never met a group with more varying and even contradictory views on things yeah. that are all friends and can preach on the same stage with radically different takes, even contradictory, exclusionarily contradictory takes on matters. And then we all go to dinner together. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's very healthy in that regard. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah I love so that. I'd like to ask you guys some questions. Okay. Giving, this is your third year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations, because most podcasts don't make 10 episodes. That's the <laughs> like that's the 90% failure rate. And the third year, well done. Uh this why is episode start? 202. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so why did you start this podcast? Good question. Out of obedience. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Good. Do you want to expound? I'm joyful. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It, well, it was first reluctant obedience and then it was joyful obedience. <laughs> mm -hmm. But really yeah. it was, we, we had started this business together because we felt like the father was leading us there. And after, after a bit with it, I suppose after some time, we're just continually seeking him for like, what is next? What is the next step? What are, you know, where do you want us to go? Um, and we felt really led to start this podcast, which was a funny thing for us because Josh and I tend to be uh, not the spotlight kind of people. Like if we were to choose and we had our way, I don't know that either one of us would be like, yeah, yeah. Put me on the mic, put me there. <laughs> And, uh, but it's been so good, honestly, because we've talked to a lot of people we wouldn't otherwise talk to. We've really been able yeah. to, um, even in our personal lives, as we're journeying through some rough stuff, because we're committed to being consistent with this and we're doing this because he's told us to do it. We're working through that regardless of whether we want to or not. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because we're leading with our journey. Um, and sometimes it's really vulnerable. Sometimes it's easy to dance around it so you don't have to be vulnerable. <laughs> but mm. uh, that's kind of, that's probably more than what you asked for, but that's that's why we started. And it's kind of evolved into what it is today. Well, yeah. Well, you're running a business in real time. At the same time, so uh, yeah, there's no there's no hiding that you're not theorists, you know, mm -hmm. you know, really practically walking it out. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be um, as you've interviewed people? What would be like two or three like takeaways, like new paradigms that were introduced to you that you really found useful or practical or good for the heart or good for business? I can tell you one. Um, for years, I have wrestled with the father on what what is death. Um, and just especially like going wow. into like sort of some of the mystical teachings and and, and even then applying that back to what I was taught in church where, okay, if I, if I die as a believer, then I have eternal life in heaven. And if I die as an unbeliever, I have eternal life in hell. So what actually is death? Because it seems like no matter what the option is eternal life. Um, and so I had wrestled with that for quite some time. And one of our guests, um, Tommy, described it at describe death as an environment of decay and that like really just settled in me is like okay like that brought some clarity to a question that i personally had wrestled with for a while of trying to put trying to put details to something i thought i understood and then realized i didn't really understand <laughs> yeah hmm. yeah that's, that's good good that will that will um 
and give you a peaceful heart for business. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll talk yeah. about this. That's going to have bookmark that. Okay. Yeah. Can but Tommy, I won't, I won't contradict. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I think for from my perspective, actually mine is all about perspective. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things over the first two seasons that has impacted me was, and it was, it was really the father teaching me this through other people. It is the appreciation of perspective. And it actually goes along with what you're talking about, Chris, um, being able to be on stage with people, um, who have completely differing opinions and theories and, um, things on certain subjects, but really, I think there's this piece of pride that I carried for a really long time. I didn't know it. And it was the like being right kind of pride, you know? And I think there's been so much growth um, through different people who we've had on combined with what the father's doing in my heart in valuing the different perspectives, even when they're completely opposite and not having to be right and not having to even hold in myself that I am right, but knowing that he is truth to them and he is truth to me and both can be held at the same time and still be yeah. valid and still be truth. And yeah, that was a big one for me. And it opens up so much more because when we talk to different people, when we have different guests on, I'm like, I'm not coming at this as like, I want to rebut something. No, I want to hear your perspective. Like, what is the facet that you hold from the father? Because mm. I feel like it gives us such a bigger, grander, more full picture of him that I couldn't get on my own. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 yeah we have to switch to, um, uh, and thinking and not or thinking. Yes. Um, if you are, if you're a Western Christian, you are, you are literally are simply a reformed Catholic. <laughs> Every, unless you're Orthodox, you're reformed Catholic. And the Reformation was a battle over truth. And then every denomination that's come from that, hundreds, maybe thousands, mm. are all a split on truth. And I understand the importance of truth, but uh, it was, is it this or this? There's no and. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't allow an and. We would, we would, uh, and we'd have to go our separate ways. On, on on the truth. You know, the Orthodox and the Catholics split over. Um, did the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? Did the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son? I mean, come on. I know it has more ramifications than that, but wow. Like, you know, churches split over whether they believe there's a, a pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture, a post-trib rapture, or no rapture. Like, you know, like, we they don't talk to each other, and we it's uh, when Christ wanted us to be one as He's one, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what he, that's what that's what He paid for, and uh, so um, because we're Protestants, Protestants, um, we split over truths and, and argument and uh, the zero sum game arguments is how we have expressed our value for God in truth and understand that truth is very important uh but relationship is uh also important i mean is it you know is it truth or, or relationship <laughs> no, it's truth and relationship you know is it word or spirit you know word and spirit and so lots of things even though contradictory are concurrently true they're just true from a, a different angle yeah and we know there's truths and there's facts and facts change. Like I was 20. That's a fact, but not anymore. But it was a fact, you know, it was Wednesday, but not anymore, you know, but truth, capital T truth never changes. Mm -hmm. And we, as people inside creation deal with truth and facts, you know, um, I've been ill. 
Truth is, Jesus healed me. Fact is, I'm in pain. <laughs> you know? um, both of those, you can happily say those in faith before God. You know, there's facts and there's truth. And the truth is what Jesus did. I will never take that from him. And the facts are what I'm walking out during the day. And, um, and they can be absolutely contradictory, yet still sit within um, a relationship with the Father, relationally, and the theological structure. Truth and relationship, they both sit quite comfortably in that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in your life and in my life, there are many things that don't line up with the finished work of Christ. I promise you, I can list them off now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a three-hour session. <laughs> you know, what is the truth? The truth is I'm the righteousness of Christ. That's the truth. Now, do I feel like the righteousness of Christ today? No. But to what? Someone fought for that truth, and because that structure is in there as a decision, it saved me a lot of pain or shame or removing myself, self-condemnation, because I know that as a truth, even though the facts of my life may not line up with that, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm raised and seed in heavenly places. Now, there are some things and attitudes and understandings and behaviors in my life that don't line up with that truth. <laughs> There's some facts about me, and facts are true, <laughs> but they're true inside creation. They're not eternally true, not capital T true. And facts are temporarily true. What's the temperature? Well, it's, you know, 65. I don't even know what 65 years. I'm on Celsius. I'm trying to learn American temperatures. <laughs> That's made up. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's negative 13 celsius all right negative 13 celsius yeah what yeah, yeah. oh it's my goodness here all right well it's nice and sunny in gulf shores alabama <laughs> <laughs> i'm not saying god has favorites i'm just saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right um well they're two really good things so I might start with what, with what Josh said, and, um, and you know, we'll see uh, how we go with that. And then yeah. afterwards, I'd like to speak to what uh, Kimberly said. Um, they're both very important. Uh, so one's a heart issue, uh, and what, then one is an understanding. So that's, that's good. That's really good. So, Josh, you talked about uh, death. Okay. So... What's the next um, big wave of theological understanding that comes through um, is what has been titled immortality. And that means different things to different people and people express it differently. To some people, it means I will stay in this body on the earth forever. And for other people, it means um, death is the defeated enemy and I'll live my life out of that regards. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it's not a fully mature theology yet. There's some theologies that get out there and get smashed around and we walk it out. But it needs to be preached in the same way that, you know, there wasn't healing except a, a, a saint from the 1600s healed somebody. So they became a saint. And then in the 50s, these big tent revivals came out, and especially anointed men and women of God which we you know, call the man of God, the man of God's come, the men and women, um, had anointings. If you came, you were at that tent when the Holy Spirit moved, miracles happened through the anointed person of God. And then, you know, that was a big thing because none that was like demonic because God doesn't heal. So anything supernatural is obviously, you know, but had to break it into our consciousness by preaching it and demonstrating, preaching and demonstrating. And then... In the 90s, people start teaching that all Christians can heal, not just the special guy with the anointing, but every Christian can. And they preached it before they saw it. And they preached it and 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 went out and did it. And now it's common understanding that you, as a Christian, you can not just pray for healing, but you command healing. You already have it inside you. That's pushed again like, oh, the disciples never prayed for healing. They gave healing. Jesus didn't say to pray. For the, for the sick, he said, heal the sick. You know, it's like, oh, click, click, click. Um, and now the success rate of Christians in just in the body uh, seeing healing 
is is huge compared to you can't do it. <laughs> and maybe God has to come down the door or a saint has to come around once every hundred years, or then the anointed man comes. But that was always available for 2,000 years. It was always available to the Christians. But it was only in the preaching of it, faith came and that truth restored. You know, and then with every new move, there's people that take it to excess and there's people that fight against it. And in the end, this heresy will become orthodoxy. <laughs> That's the way it always works. <laughs> this is heresy. And then eventually it becomes, of course, you know, the same as the charismatic gifts when they came out. This is the devil's work. And now, you know, it's just, someone says, oh, I've got a word of knowledge for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like you just accept it. You know, when first people, when people first came out, I had a word of prophecy. They're like, you can prophesy, but you're a prophet. Like Elijah in the Bible, who do you think you are? You know, you can heal some. You think you can heal somebody? Who do you think you are? Very offensive, and then becomes accepted. And so, uh, immortality uh, will start to be preached a lot, uh, and um, it will have. If it's the move of God that God's on, then the fruit will be there. And the guy who started uh, really in the modern era. This guy called Kubus van Rensburg from South Africa. And you can look up his videos because to him, everything's death, okay, and death defeated. So you came in him with a headache or crutches or AIDS, it's all death. And death's defeated, and you get rid of it the same way. And his success rate of healing was just extraordinary because nothing had a ranking to it. It wasn't like a headache, you know, cancer's worse than a headache. Because it's all death. It's like the worst of the worst. So if someone came to him who was dead, <laughs> literally, or a sore knee, it's the same thing. It's all defeated. So he didn't rank anything. And uh, he really blasted out an, uh, an area for us. And all modern, uh, current immortality speakers would still be immortality would just be part of the, of the gospel was in like tongues as part of the gospel healing as part of the gospel the defeat of death would just be part of the gospel soon which would be amazing which we're going to need um soon <laughs> and um uh that all would we'll probably refer back to kubis van rensburg and the, and the work that he did yeah uh so the reason this is important is that all fear is fear of death all fear okay and so fear of death is uh, financial death, opportunity death, relationship death, reputation death, physical death. You know, all, it's all fear of death, okay? And the fear of death comes from the fact that you don't believe in your heart that God will give it to you, either because you don't qualify, which is a judgment on you, or um, God wouldn't do that, which is a judgment on him. If he says he will, <laughs> that's his word, that's who he is. But because we don't believe for some reason that God would do that for us, like God wouldn't do that for me, either God wouldn't do it, no, did God really say, first Adam, or if you are the son of God, do this, you know, second Adam's fight. And uh, when you don't believe that God has given it to you through a promise, through a free gift, already purchased, already given everything you need for life and godliness has been given to you and he cares for you like he knows the sparrows like this is all real stuff uh you will have to reach with your own hand you have to fight to keep it which is fear or fight to preserve it or fight to get it and that's all from fear and all fear is fear of death okay and death is separation from god there's something in your mind that believes you're separated from god either god's that's God's character, that he would do that to you, or that's your worth, okay? You've turned yourself from God by self-condemnation because God's not doing it, okay? And uh, that is death, separation from God. And so in our mind, if we separate ourselves from God, we operate in death, okay? That's why it says anything not from faith is sin. Like, what does that mean? You know, do I clean my teeth by faith? Am I sinning while I clean my teeth? No, it's the separation from god mm. that is the driver so death is the driver okay so death can be the driver of many good things because pure sonship and religion and rebellion 
can all be the same in their actions. It's only the heart that tells the difference. So I, um, I'm a very non-confrontational person by nature. And um, I think the gospel that I'm going to preach in the coming eras can be very confrontational. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a good choice, in my opinion. <laughs> but um, uh, so when um, someone came, if I, it always happened. If I got given bad food at a restaurant, I would never, ever complain about it, ever. Do you know why? Because I'm a son of God. I'm in the kingdom. I'll get another steak another day. It's okay. It doesn't really matter. And besides, the guy at the back, he is probably on $5 an hour. Who knows why he messed it up? Perhaps his daughter's sick. We don't know these things, okay? All these amazing theology, very loving. I care for that person. It's all not true. I hate conflict. I hate confrontation. I hate the tension of talking to someone. I don't want to stand up for myself. And so... I would give, I would, I would eat the food and I feel like violated on the inside. You can't fake it, okay? But the action is very noble. <laughs> but I was caught, so I was saying I'm doing a loving thing here. Yeah, I'm loving the guy back there. I don't get him, get him in any trouble. But it wasn't love. It was fear. Hmm. I fear, put my hand up saying, hey, you know, this isn't what I ordered. <laughs> Kevin, I don't, I don't want to do that, have that conversation. I'm too scared to do it. So I was calling fear love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the same with that. I would never ask for a discount on anything ever. Do you know why? I'm a son of God. I'm in the kingdom. I have my words, my bond. If he says that's what it costs, I'll pay him. If I can't afford it, I won't do it. That's how I operate. That's how he operates. You know, I ask for a discount. I'm a son of the king. Oh, if I can afford it, I want it, I'll get it. If I can't, I won't, which sounds very noble. <laughs> but uh, it's a lie coming from me because I'm too scared to ask for a discount. Yep. And uh, in one year, God gave me so many opportunities. I kept getting bad food. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I remember sending the first one back. I was in Cape Town, South Africa, in the in the gardens there at their restaurant, and the food was burnt. And I had I I started to eat it, <laughs> and I knew send it back. So I went to send it back. It's clearly overcooked, like even visually. And uh, so the staff went and got the manager. And then you know, so it escalated, and escalated. They had to wait for a new burger and the dinner was over. Everyone's going back. My food hadn't come. It was very important. And then uh, one time I was in Chile. I was buying a suit. I needed a suit. I was buying this nice suit. And then as I'm buying the suit, I knew I need to ask for a discount. And I felt this pressure. I felt so much pressure, 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 pressure. Can I ask for a discount? Can I ask for a discount? And then this guy said me, and I went, <laughs> I went, uh, he gave me the price. I uh, literally with this, can you do any better? <laughs> like my whole body. It's like it was like this energetic set was around me, like of locked in. And when I said, can you do any better? Like my whole body went, <laughs> like this. He goes, yeah, yeah, we could probably knock this much off. And I said, and if I pay cash, <laughs> like, and I'm like, like, I like, like probably the whole room went blank, like I couldn't see anything. And he goes, yeah. Yeah, we'll give another five percent for that. So I realized like that was easy, but I wouldn't ask him for discount because of this theology I had, calling it like the kingdom and nobility, but it's not. It was just fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're fearful, you don't have choice. You need choice for love. Because God may ask you to ask for a discount, but he might go and say, Hey, pay the full price. Yeah, pay the full price, or don't send it back. But when you're not hearing from God, you can't make that choice because you've got fear happening. Yeah. One second. Sorry about that noise in the background. There's a, there's a dog and you <laughs> wanted to have a drink. <laughs> anyway, if you can hear that on the mic. <laughs> um, hear okay, that's good. Yeah. And so uh, when you overcome fear, you've got choice because Jesus had choice. 
He could cool down angels or not cool down angels. He could heal or he could walk away. And he did sometimes. Uh, you need the ability to have a choice, otherwise you can't be led by the Spirit. But you've got fear. You can put all religious language around that fear. Uh, and then uh, it looks like the action looks the same as love. Yeah? Not sending food back, whatever. Okay. So all fear is fear of death. So that's just uh, on the mental, even soul level. So here we go. This is why you probably asked me on here. <laughs> We need to change the very uh, being that we are. So Christianity is not a change in belief systems. Okay, you don't go from a Buddhist to a Christian or an atheist to a Christian. It's a change in species. It's an ontological shift. You are now a different thing. Okay, you were a human, and now you are a son of God. And there's ramifications. You're a different class of being now. That different class of being has access to different things and behaves a different way. Has a different nature, and the nature it has is of the mature son, which is the father. Okay, and that's already inside you. So the similar amounts, not a list of things for the Christian to ascribe to or achieve, it actually describes your existing nature. You are a son of God. You are. Okay, and so similar amount tells you to bless your enemies. Well, that's actually your core nature now. You look, you look like your dad. You were literally born again from above. You are the same class of being that Jesus is. Because he's the first of many, okay? So whatever he is, you are. And that nature is given to you as a free gift. And all we're doing is changing our mind, okay, to think like him and be like him and behave like him. That's all we're doing. So uh, Christianity is, is learning what you already are. That's what it is. But even Christianity is a difficult term because Christianity wasn't, God didn't call us Christians, okay? Pagans called us Christians. And it's a useful term. I'm a Christian from the outside looking in for the world, as far as the world's concerned. Yep, I'm a Christian. As far as God's concerned, I'm a son of God. I'm his son. I behave like his son. You have that new nature inside us. Now, through the years, uh, the centuries, through the generations, uh, from Adam, you want to put it that way, uh, when Adam got kicked out of the garden, an accusation. It's the woman you put me with here. It's the woman you put me here with. Like you did this to me. Yeah. It's not my fault. You did it. And then and uh, Eve's like, it's the snake. Like you did this, God. And that accusation against God being a good father that keeps his word is still in us. And you know when you come up against it. The first time you get disappointed, the first time a prayer doesn't seem to come through or he's not faithful or something. It just pings you, yeah? And if you have agreement inside you, which all humans do, is looking for that agreement. And uh, if we become like Christ, we need to deal with all these things because Christ, he could walk through the crowd. He has nothing in common with them, okay? He didn't have murder in common, didn't hate God, didn't have religion in common. He dealt with that in his DNA. I'm going to say DNA. I mean, yeah, like metaphorically and actually, who knows how these things are encoded in us? We could see different light bands. We could probably see this in our DNA. Okay. And so uh, <laughs> in 2013, uh, I burnt out ministry for the second time. <laughs> and I was laying in my bed, angry with God, because I'm like, bro, all I did was serve you. And here I am again. Yeah. <laughs> and um, anyway, Skipping all that bit, just another <laughs> hour. Um, uh, but come back into play. Um, I I realize I don't know God or His voice after being in ministry for many years. Uh, the gospel worked. Like I preached the the gospel, the grace gospel, effectively with sonship, and it had its effect because it's the gospel. The gospel does all its work. But me personally, uh, I kept burning out. So something was wrong. So I decided to see if I could live just off the word of God alone, okay, which is not more spiritual. It's a way <laughs> of living, okay, a way, not the way, a way. But it was important for me. And so what I wanted to see is could I uh, hear a word from God 
and do it and all the provision for life be in obeying that word alone. Okay. And so in the same way, a seed has everything in it to grow into a tree and then produce its own fruit. The only, only difference is the soil. Okay. All right. If I get aware from God, I need to be good soil, 30, 60, or 100. That's all good. They're all good returns. Uh, I'm sure every business will be happy with 30 fold return, <laughs> 30, 60, 100. And uh, if I could just believe it and just be at peace, that that sea would grow and all the provision would come from a bang, that word, and nothing else. And uh, so I listened to a lot of uh, a guy called George Mueller. Do you, you have, are you familiar with George Mueller? Okay. So he's from the late 1800s. Uh, yes, I think that's right. And um, he was a German that was living in England. And when uh, Wilberforce ended the slavery, slave trade in England, okay, uh, the economy collapsed. And then in Bristol, which was a slave port, uh, the economy collapsed and there's no money and, and no one could afford to keep their kids. So they put their kids out in the street, basically. And kids were housed in jail. So you had eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds in jail. And uh, industries were using them to do dangerous jobs, which had a life expectancy of maybe two weeks. Like, clean out the chemical bin, please. And I was just an, uh, a usable asset. And he was grieved by this. He wanted to start an orphanage, but he didn't, didn't have any money. And uh, he wanted to start an orphanage, and he found, like I think, you know, like a penny on the ground. I need to get this story right. <laughs> I keep misquoting it. But he said that if God can give me a penny, he can give me anything he wants. Mm -hmm. He made a decision. I'll never ask any man for money ever. I'll only tell God. Okay. And then he's got testimony after testimony of staying in an orphanage, building it, then buying land, then building these giant mansions on this land that the 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 um the Queen's architect did all the work for for free. Like we're never asking for money. End up putting like in today's money, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars went through. Like it's, it's extraordinary. His rule was to never tell anyone. He just go to his room wow. and say, okay, we need this. And his stories are, you may have heard these stories of an orphanage in England that set up the tables for food, but they had no food and everyone gets out there and they sit with a knife and fork and there's no food. But then it's coming because God promised and they just sit there. Then something would happen. A, a wedding would be cancelled or a truck would be diverted. There would be a storm and the food would come. And in all their years, they never missed a single meal. And now the houses he built for the orphans are now some of the most expensive <laughs> uh, apartments. <laughs> They're up on this beautiful hill overlooking Bristol. And, you know, he had the best of everything. And he never asked God. So I listened to his, had his audio, had it on audio book. I listened to him speak over and over again. And, you know, from his era, he'd say, oh, brethren, the, the joy in the bosom when the wonderful creator condescends to hear my humble prayer. Yeah, and his humble prayer is, can you feed 2,000 people today? <laughs> like, and I so said, every day was a miracle for him, every single day. And if you, have, you try and faith it in with your soul, you will go bananas. You just have to collapse and break under that. God is good and he keeps his word. So I was excited about this. And I thought, you can live this way? Like forever on the earth, just obeying a word will bring all the provision. I'll never ask for money. I'll never have to raise money. I'll never have to do anything. Like you can have a job, but you know, like do what God asks you to do. Like whatever, start start a bank doesn't matter. But the point is, the promise of what God says is is the source. But now you're relying on an invisible God. Mm -hmm. So if you have any accusations in your heart against God, or any fear of death, or any idea of separation. They're going to come to the fore. Okay. So, this is more than a mental change. It's going to go deep into the very core of the being that you are. Okay. So, we're about to hear this, <laughs> how this happened for me. So, I was in Turkey at the time in a city called Izmir. And uh, I was staying in this apartment up on Izmir, is like along the coast and it has a steep embankment that you got where everyone lives. Mm -hmm. And it was like over 100 degrees. And I was staying in this tiny apartment. And I remember I paid my last 20 Turkish lira for dinner. And then I was on no money. I'm by myself. Like, I'm, what's my story? I've been in ministry twice. I've burnt out twice. <laughs> now I'm in Turkey. 
<laughs> like I've got nothing to show for my whole life and let's see if this works. And uh, I was really excited. So I went to bed, I wake up the next day and I'm like, all right, what's going to happen? Because I listened to so much George Mueller and mm -hmm. um, another lady, Pentecostal lady, can't remember her name, who will come back to me about just amazing provision, just obey the word, radical obedience, all the provision comes. You know, people landing in countries and some being, waiting for them at the airport and all these things. I'm like, all right, same father, let's go. And so I wake up in the morning. I thought, well, I've got no money. I can't just fast in the house. That's not faith. So I thought, what would I normally do? In Turkey, you normally go have breakfast, which is you walk down to the cafe, a little Turkish coffee and an apricot and some egg and some honey. And so I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I've got no money. I go out. I'm walking down to the down the big slope. It's like probably 100 degrees in the morning. And walking down to the cafe, I thought, what's going to happen? Something's going to happen. Is someone going to send me money on my, on my phone? You know, I'm going to find $50 on the ground. I'm going to meet somebody. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. I'm walking, walking. I get down to the foreshore, and now I'm close to the cafe. And, but in my mind, there's no way this isn't going to work. Like, I am through. Like, the, the word has produced faith. Like, I believe it just by hearing and hearing and hearing what's already inside me. That God is faithful and will provide what's already given to me in the nature of the sun has reached my soul. Like I believe it. I walk up to the cafe, I go at the cafe door, and nothing's happened. And in Turkey, they always greet you at the cafe. So guys go, hello, friend, come in, come in, friend. I'm standing at the cafe door and nothing happened. And then I can only describe it as an atmosphere. This atmosphere came around me, and it was, I can only describe it as uh Soul, the soul pain of abandonment. And if you've ever seen a kid at the shopping center, you're holding your hand, whether they let go of mum's hand and they can't see mum, even though mum's might just be there, mm. and they're looking around and a little bit of terror comes on them and you see a meltdown, okay? So I was in my late 30s and that's exactly what happened to me. I started to melt like a little kid. Like, it didn't work. It doesn't work for me. Like, God's abandoned me. And I really believed. It's like I put all, sorry to use a gambling term, but I put all chips on black. Like I put everything on. Like, sure. God is faithful. He will provide for me. I'm standing there. And this atmosphere came around. And it felt like uh, you need to burn your hand, like that pain. I felt like my soul had been burnt. And you know if you ever burn your hand and then you put it under the water and, all the, and you go, ah, oh, like that. I was in this pain. And around me was this pain and this atmosphere. And I knew that if I said these words exactly, it didn't work. The pain would go. And I'm thinking, why do I know that? I wanted to say it because I wanted this pain to stop. And the pain was, God doesn't care for you. Like, you're abandoned. Mm. Like, you're an idiot. What were you thinking? Like, you think I would do that for you? Not that God wouldn't do it. God wouldn't do it for you. Sure. You're the faulty one here. And uh, and I was, was crumbling like a little kid, and the guy's going, "Friend, the friend, come in." And I'm sitting there like, and I'm feeling, I feel like I'm about to cry, and I'm just being silent, and because I was taught by a good word of faith guy, Carrie Blake, if you can't speak faith, don't speak. So it's like silent there. And I just wanted the pain to stop, and I felt so stupid. What have you done, Chris? You've left ministry for the second time. What are you going to do with no money? Clop your dad that doesn't believe in God and say, hey, dad, you know, the, the, the God that you don't even think exists? Yeah, he didn't pay for me. And like, can you fly me home? <laughs> All these thoughts are coming to me, like flood, flood, and then this deep sorrow. I'm like, God, I need something, 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 something. And then I remembered that uh, three months earlier, my dad had given me 80 English pounds because I was traveling. He hadn't used them. And I couldn't remember cashing it in, which is crazy because I'd spent all my money, like everything, I had no money, like every reserve, no money in my pockets, nothing. And I thought, that's the only thing I knew. I just walked out of the cafe, backed away from the guy waving at me. I walked up the hill. And I finally got to the top of the hill. I'm sweating. But this pain is still there. So I just have to like just go to blank. You know, like sometimes I'm, I'm in my 40s, so... 
my telephone, my TV used to turn off at 11.30 and just go to a blank. Okay, my, I was just doing that. I go up to my little apartment and I open up my my um, suitcase, which is almost as big as the room. I went through everything, trying to find 80 pounds. Well, that's the only thing I knew that, only thing that came to me. So 80 pounds, 80 pounds, 80 pounds, looking for it, looking for it, looking for it. Went through everything and it wasn't there. And this pain, okay, <laughs> you might have to edit this out later. <laughs> this pain turned to like rage, right? And I knew at that time, one thing is just annoying. Before I knew if I said this doesn't work, it would disappear. I knew at that time why they pulled Jesus' beard out, which is a very specific thing. I know why. They want God to feel their hurt. And I knew at this time <laughs> that if I said the word, see, you always do this to me, which is abandonment that the pain would go. And this pain there wasn't just pain of abandonment. I wanted to hurt Jesus. And I'm sitting here as a pastor <laughs> who's just <laughs> moving on by faith. This has not gone the way I wanted it to go. I'm sitting on this bed. It's so hot. I'm sweating. I've got no money. I'm in Izmir, Turkey. I couldn't catch the bus if I wanted to. Like, I've got nothing on me. And I'm sitting there. and I had this, like, wasn't murder. I don't want to kill God, but I want him to feel pain. I want him to feel the pain I'm feeling. You know, and this is this is the DNA in humanity. We want we want God, I want God to hurt. And you understand why they did Jesus what they did. That's that rage of the, the abandonment in the garden from our point of view that you did this to us. I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, God, I'm about to lose it all. You know, which is I was very excited about Christianity an hour ago. <laughs> and now I don't know what's happening. And I'm just sitting there. I thought, if nothing comes through, like I have to return to Australia broke and with no ability or trust in you or something. It like everything's on the line now. And there's atmospheres around me, which I didn't really understand that how demonic it was at the time. Because uh, I'm dealing with a very voice of satan from the garden that still resides in us did god really say would he do that for you i'm sitting there sitting there sitting there and <laughs> something so i must have reached and pulled jesus beard i'm like what is happening and i looked down beside me and there was a uh singapore airlines uh, eye patch case and it's the only thing i hadn't checked so i'm looking at this case <laughs> i reached down for it and even as soon as i picked it up like god just like I felt the money inside there. I didn't have to look. I opened it up and it was the 80 pounds was in there. So I cried over 80 pounds. <laughs> and I went down and I found an illegal money exchange person. And uh, he went, he didn't accept one of, the, one of the notes, a 10 pound note, because it had Scotland written on it. So I still have that note to this day. I've kept that. And with my 70 pounds, I probably got about 50 pounds worth of Turkish lira. <laughs> and that 50 pounds, like it, that's what set me off. And I, I never, uh, I, from that moment, I went by the, the word of God and the word of God provided. But what was after was that, that deep accusation in me that God abandoned me. And, um, and both ways, that's who he is. That's what you do. And also that's what I'm worth. I'm the, there's something faulty about me that God abandons me. God does stories for Kimberly, does stories for Joshua, great stories, but he doesn't do it for me. At the end of the day, there's something faulty about me. And so guilt is I've done something wrong, but shame is there's something wrong about me. Right. But the, 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 it's not the thing I've done is inherently my being, and that's what shame is. And that's what God was going after, that shame. If you have shame, you remove yourself from God one way or another, and you either see I'm not good, or you say to God, you're not good, and then death. Yeah. And then you then it works from death. So God doesn't look after me. I have to reach my own hand to do something. The works of the flesh are under a curse that always bring death. No matter what, build an orphanage for the for the love of for the goodness of God. If it's from death, if it's from God doesn't love me, so I need to do something great. I met many 
missionaries around the world as I traveled, and some from a beautiful place of brokenness, and some from uh, missionaries from separation. I need to do something for God. And it brings death, you know. Um, yeah. And so it's the fear of death that keeps you bound to the devil. And Jesus has overcome death. He's given us the same resurrection life he has, which is an eternal, immortal life. And uh, Romans says, seek glory, honor, and immortality. Seek it. You know, where churches say, you don't seek immortality. Wow. And don't seek glory. We're not seeking glory for this. We're seeking the glory. The glory says, the same glory I have for the foundation of the earth, I give to them. Like, you got to know who you are. That's amazing. Who would do that? Only Christ can have that glory. He gives it to us. So he's, he's making us, he's bringing us up, be, be with him. You know, we'll never be greater than him. He was first. But we're going to be exactly like him, to grow up and be like the son. So that was the fear of death. And I just, uh, about two months later, or six weeks later, I guess, I was in the middle of Turkey. And I went to a place called Goroma, because that's where lots of uh, the fact that Jesus is fully God, fully man, was uh, fought for there by um, Athanasius sent Gregory and Basil and these other guys out there to believe in the incarnation and keep keep that truth hidden. They lived inside caves, and uh, it's an amazing place. I was out there for that. And I had paid my last money. I booked a place out there like for 10 days, like a cave. I lived in the cave, <laughs> but it's a nice cave. And um, <laughs> as water and air conditioning is very nice. And um, on my last night there, I spent my last five lira on this, on some food. I rang up my friend, Chad, and saying, hey, I've got no money left. Something's going to happen tomorrow. I hung up the phone and I went downstairs and I said to the guy, because I'm checking out tomorrow. I said, uh, when's checkout? He says, 12 o'clock. So great. Because I need to get, I don't have money for a bus. I can't leave town. I can't do anything. Like I need the next miracle. Been lots of miracles in this time. So I'm used to it now. My soul's beginning to calm down. And he says, um, you, uh, yeah, 12 o'clock, just come and pay then. I was like, oh, it's okay. I paid on booking.com. I was like, no, no, not in Turkey. You have to pay at the place. I said, no, I think I paid on booking.com. He said, no, in Turkey, you pay at the end. I'm like, Oh no. I went and checked my, my computer and the money hadn't got out. I hadn't paid. I uh I was working off the cash. I, I didn't have any I was working off cash, so I knew how much money I had. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. I booked a place and I haven't paid for it. I feel like I've messed this up. This thing. Just bad um administration, bad economics. So bad. <laughs> so I sat down in my room that night. I was like, well, it was late, late at night. It's like, God, I'm not going to pray for two reasons. Um, I'll pray myself out of faith if I start praying. Or even worse, I'll monitor my prayer to see if it's a good one. Because we've all done that. Sorry, dog. <laughs> um, so I'll monitor my prayer to see if it's a good one. You ever done that? You're praying, you listen to your prayer, go, oh, that sounds good. Like, <laughs> So uh, I uh, sat down. And um, I said, my faith is I'm not going to pray. New news has happened. I'm just going to go to bed. So I went to bed, thought, I'm going to have a great dream tonight. It's going to be wonderful. I'm going to have this, like, God's going to speak to me. And went to bed, a little bit of panic, <laughs> but mostly peace. And then I wake up in the morning, no dreams. Which I found a little bit offensive. I was like, why are you going to speak to me? So I checked my laptop, no money. So I had breakfast in the hotel, which was included in the room, <laughs> my honeycomb and egg and all that. And uh, and then I left, went back to my room, and checked my laptop, no money. So I'm like, oh, no, I think I've messed this up, right? Just hold. You know, just don't say anything. Don't agree with that. Like, don't say this doesn't work. Or don't, don't say you never do this for me. Just hold. If you can't say faith, don't even speak. So I just whoop. <laughs> I went out, went for a walk around this beautiful town, came back. It was 11, and I packed up my bag. I checked, came back, came back checked my laptop, no money. I packed up my bag in half hour, put it against the wall, and uh, opened my laptop to see if there was any money. And I was too scared to check my bank account. So I checked my emails. There was an email from my dad. And my dad said, hey, I uh, just hope you're doing well. Um, your brother, his roller door, electric roller door, his garage broke, so I paid for it. 
So I'm just going to give you the same amount of money to keep everything even. It was like 2000 Australian or something. And I was like, I don't know, you should cry over money, but I cried. Like, again, like I cried. And because Australia, it was like domestic transfers so or straight through. No, $2,000. And we'd be living off like $50 for like two months. Like <laughs> $2,000 is like <laughs> mega millionaire, you know. And uh, and that broke, I was like, and I knew this is real. This is happening. And that was 2013. So all the way through till now, except for 2020, I had a I had a wage for a year. But uh, so 10 of the last 11 or nine of the last 10 years, I, I lived that way. Um, it was good. And I learned lots and lots of things, lots of rules of thumb by doing that. But the point is, that's not a more spiritual way of living, okay? Because some of the people that looked after me were millionaires that had started good businesses and raised their family and, and made good business decisions and bought extra properties and I stayed in their houses. So, you know, everyone was, has to obey what God's asked them to do. And what I'm telling you this for is you have to deal with the, the DNA of that inside you, that fear of death. Because fear of death brings separation from God or separation from God brings fear of death. It's the same thing because that's what death is, that separation from God, out of Eden, out of communion. And God's restored that. That's why we have a clear conscience so we can access God at all times. We have a clear conscience. We can just go to God no matter what you've done because only life in communion with God, that's the only place you can get life and get cleaned up. And so me, after serving God my whole life and being a pastor twice, uh, that was my experience. Like I really, not only did I not trust God, there was rage against God in me, like furious with him. and. So that dealt with me and God used provision as the mechanism for that. But you could use many other aspects of that, of needs of life, uh, felt needs of life. But for me, it was provision. And so um, this is money mystics. So in the area you're going into, um, to deal with death, the fear of death, is super important because uh, you look at your bank account to make decisions. But you can't make decisions on your bank account. You make decisions on what God has said. Yeah, that's the word. And there's good management and good business principles. I'm not against those at all and very wise ways of using money. But the voice is what he said. And like if you're money mystics, what happens if you go bankrupt? You're the money mystics. You know, why have you take a, a business decision? This is fear of reputation death. This is fear of social death. This is all fear of death. You know, why have you run out of money? What if, what if a bank comes and gets your your, your house? Yeah, you know, you, we're the money mystics, you know. Um this is this is fear of death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh as all all aspects of life, health or relationships or your children, or it's all a fear of death. And God, Jesus broke death for us he overcame death it's a defeated foe and our joy is that we get to participate in that otherwise he could have done it all for us but we overcome in ourselves we're overcoming that record of death in ourselves kicked out of the garden yeah and uh, i was listening to uh samuel and kings last night and um some rabbis from the west we have a, a very um we're very moral orientated in our christianity so it's a it's a very moral thing. So we read King David's life through morality. So Bathsheba is the biggest thing in our mind. Okay. But rabbinics don't necessarily see it that way. They have a moral grid. They they have an idolatry grid because idolatry is the biggest issue. And so for them, the biggest sin that David committed easily was when he counted his army before going to war. And that and 70,000 died because he counted his army. And because uh, he was a dollar, he looked at the arm of flesh. And for um, some rabbis, that is clearly his big sin. <laughs> not killing a guy and taking his wife. It's not a morality issue for them. It's not a idolatry issue. Because he, he repeated the sin about them. He didn't believe in God's word, the invisible promise. So he reached for something he could have. Yeah. And um, I remember uh, Kirby Delanero, uh saying that. Uh, if you travel, or I can't remember what, what his example was, but he said, um, would you rather, if God told you to go around the world for a year, would you rather have a million dollars in the bank or a promise from, or God, a word from God to go? Well, you'd rather have a million dollars in the bank. 
he would. And he said, this is his words, not mine. He says, you'd rather a million words, a million um, uh, dollars in the bank because you hate faith. That was very shocking. You got, you got everyone's attention. You got my attention. Holy smokes. Because even after all the faith, I still want to have a million dollars in the bank. If God said to me, now, Chris, go travel through all the Kazakhstans and stuff like that, you, you know, and here's 40 grand up front, I feel a lot better with 40 grand up front than, than the promise of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to taste, touch, and see. I don't believe the invisible promise will provide. The invisible promise is the very nature of God himself. So I'm not trusting. I want taste, touch, see. I'm going to count my army. I'm going to look at my bank account. I see what's there rather than the nature of my father. And when we become sons of God, which are spirit beings, spirit beings live by the promises or by the words of their father. They just do what they see the father doing. Okay. And so God says, we're going to Kazakhstan. Well, we're going to Kazakhstan. Like a little kid, if you, your parents are going to Disneyland tomorrow, you don't go, really? Show me the tickets. Do we have money for that? You know, how's that going to happen? But that, you, Dad said we're going to Disneyland. So you're going to Disneyland, okay? It, God says we're going to Kazakhstan. We're going right now. Some people are like, we're going to Saudi Arabia, like, you know, or Yemen right now. And God said, and well, that's your promise, nothing else. And from there, because you don't fear death, you've got free choice. And God may say, take out insurance. Well, don't worry about insurance. Like everyone's different, you know. We have free choice with a clear conscience because the fact that God said it is your life. So when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't raise himself from the dead. He had a word from the Father, I'll raise you up from the dead. <laughs> so he completely died onto that word, you know what I'm saying? And um, we know that Peter walked on the water. But he didn't walk on the water, he walked on the promise because of who said it. He walked on that word, come. That's he walked on, that word. Then he looked at natural circumstances and the invisible promise didn't hold him anymore. And that is the exact one-to-one -one metaphor picture of what we're doing. Mm. Back to Jesus said it. In fact, Jesus said, let's travel the world. Let's start a business. Or, you know, let's, uh, you've been divorced, let's get married again. Like, you know, whatever it is. The fact that God said it, that's it. You rely on that promise, that word. And that's what you're walking on. You don't look at the natural Look at the promise, and because he is faithful. And um, I remember one day, uh, Curry Blake, the guy who said, "If you can't speak faith, don't speak." He's got some crazy stories about that. <laughs> he prayed for people, and they died. And the people, what's happening? He's like, just held, and then a day later, hey, he came back. <laughs> so it's just he couldn't speak in faith. <laughs> so just shut up <laughs> and um so he um what was i saying hear the story um no i've lost it i've lost myself i've distracted myself with my own rabbit trail but um <laughs> yeah he's a good guy <laughs> he's got lots of stories uh yeah so that's uh uh just thinking what joshua said about about death yeah <laughs> You go, go, you go curious, be born again. I'm curious what that has looked like in your life, like the past few years. Is it, is it still, um, is it still, is, are there still elements of stress? Is it, has it been, has God slowly changed the way that works in you? Or is it always like, here's something now here's zero, here's something, or, um, I know you said he, for during 2020, you had a wage, um, so was that like, was it a good like respite, like like rest from that? Or? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, after my first year of traveling this way, um, I got home to Australia after this year of miraculous traveling. And I got home and I got in the car. My parents picked me up from the airport and I've just got back from an overnight flight from Singapore. I haven't slept overnight. And I get home, my parents say, so you're going to get a job now? In the car on the way back. I'm like, um, you know, I've got this new thing, <laughs> exciting thing happening. but still very precious. And God did it for a year. So I thought that's pretty, you know, crazy, generous, like a year. Okay. So I started thinking about that. And um, uh, I uh, 
they went on, on this family holiday in January and I was, st- I didn't go on the holiday. I was in the house and I was just cooking late at night, like at midnight. <laughs> had the radio playing. No, 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 silence. It was dead, it was dead silence. I was asking God some things. And uh, I'm just cooking at night time. And I felt, I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? I thought, I should get a job. My parents asked me to get a job. So I'm here. I'll work. No problem. I love my parents. Um, I'll do that. Which is not, that's fine. That's good. Because I did get a job. I went to my friend's bakery. <laughs> it was just fun. But then my, heart, then my heart went, imagine, imagine that every Friday, just knowing you got $500 coming or 1000 or 200 because I didn't know any time. Sometimes you live on $20 for a month. And so that $20 just sits there, you know, and you, that's all that is there. And you go buy a ticket and then you're going to go to somewhere else. And then you go buy dinner or you go out, all these things. Go to a wedding with no money. And then everything, suits, presents, accommodation all gets provided. And we just don't tell anyone. That was my rule. I don't tell anyone. All my friends thought I was the, must be the richest guy in the world. <laughs> Everyone thought, Chris is super rich. And that was my, always my my default thing is I'm the wealthiest guy in the room because anything I need to do can be done. So I don't have to worry about anything. That's that's wealth, yeah? I'm the richest guy in the world because everything I need to do and lots of things I wanted to do, just desires, God paid for. Learned lots of things that way. And so I'm home in Adelaide and uh, I'm, I'm working, I'm sitting cooking. I'm like, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be, oh, just imagine having a wage. That every Friday, you know, you got $500. I was just thinking, wow, that'd be amazing, right? And, um, and then I heard this music playing, almost like if you know the movie Inception, like the movie the music plays in the atmosphere. And I heard this music and I turned around and looked at the radio. Radio's off. There's no one else in the house. But I could clearly hear this music. And the, and the tune went, dun, 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 dun. I was like, I know this song. I know this song. I was really excited because that means this is something, this is God. This is a spiritual moment. God's speaking to me. And if, if I get the lyrics to this song, because I know this song, if I get these lyrics, God will answer me. I'm thinking, what should I do? What should I do? I'm going to get a job. I have a wage. That'd be cool. You know, I can plan things now. You know, And I'm really excited. God's speaking to me. My heart's wide open. Like, what is it, God? What is it? And the lyrics came to me. You're as cold as ice. You're willing to sacrifice our love. I was like, uh, my brain's like, that can't be right. Like, just denial. <laughs> but I knew it was true. And God let me sit there. Like, your fence is there. Like, your fence. Because God exposes the heart through a fence. You know? And then God told me, like, we traveled together around the world. Together, father and son. That's our love. That's what we did together. You and me. And then we know you want to get a wage. Like go to the arm of flesh for your source. That's cold. <laughs> like what? And then um, I didn't realize that God loved it. I thought it was faith. You know, I'm working this principle of faith. That's what sons of God can do. Um, so, you know, it's available in the kingdom. But I never actually understood that that was our love. Mm. That He loved it, and I knew go again and this, this understanding comes so chris you travel the world by faith faith is exhausting travel the world by love i do you know what that meant like yeah. instantly understood like for like hold to a verse or hold like all right find the um you know hong kong like there'll be accommodation when i get there just hold 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 and that nervous energy and, and, and the thing happens and oh you know and again and again and again. And just holding by faith is exhausting. It's of the soul, my faith. We want the faith of God. The faith of God is a subset of his love and nature. So God said, go again, around the world again. Not just at once, which I thought was so in self-indulgent. He said, this time travel by love, not by faith. So it took me three months to leave. I got a rebuke dream because I was just couldn't do it it was so exhausting traveling by faith i thought i knew just go and don't faith anything in just go knowing i provided so i just i went to south africa to start and uh i didn't ever pray about provision ever again 
in that regard. I just started traveling and that was a new thing that got added. So, um, yeah, faith came from the fact that I was loved. It was a natural outflow. So that's the faith of God rather than faith in God. And you can have faith in God and faith in his word and you can hold it together. You can hold it together. But, you know, if, you've got, if you're a single mum with two kids or, you know, <laughs> you get the flu, you're not holding it. <laughs> Your soul goes down. You know, one, two nights of bad sleep, you're not holding anything, you know. So you have to surrender. No, you're loved. He said it. But Jesus to be resurrected and have to hold, hold. He's like, be unto me according to your word, like his mum, and just rested in the fact that that's God's word. Oh, he brings you back to Curry Blake. And because uh, I remember Curry Blake, who always believes that you are healed, God has healed, and he works from that point of view. He said, I would die believing I was healed. And Christ has healed me because I won't take that from him. He did it. And his back ripped open and the cross. So it's done. And so I rest in that fact. I rest in that truth. Facts are I'm dying, although I died. I won't change that. I won't take that from him. And when he said that, that just really, that led me to believe. Because I used to think I don't believe because I couldn't see the results. I thought, yeah. what's wrong with me? Why can't you just believe these words you're reading? You know? <laughs> and realized, but I do believe. I do believe Jesus paid for my sins and my sickness. And they gave me freedom. No matter what the facts are, that's true. I live in that truth and let me to rest in the fact that was true. Yeah. So, uh, and that's you're dying. You're dying to the senses, the taste, touch, see, feel. You, you, an invisible word is more important to you. That's the expression, the nature of the Father. When you see that relationally, we see it as a theological truth, construct, eternal truth. It doesn't matter. It's the same same thing because his eternal word truth is his person, They're the same thing. So, you know, a believing, to, be, to believe is God's love language. It wants to be believed. So, yeah. So if you, because Christianity is a dying and rising again. Mm-hmm. And I died daily. There's lots of, there's lots of that in different areas. And you can believe God for health, but not for your taxes. You know, you believe God in finance but not in your health. Like it's really where we compartmentalize these things. It's good about childhood. You know, if your dad paid for everything when you're growing up, you believe God will pay for everything. But if dad didn't pay for anything and made you work hard for stuff, then it's going to be very hard to believe that God would give something to you as a free gift. Yeah. So what it gives you is choice, and uh, which is love must come from a free will choice. So um, now I'm an employee again. So it's a new era for me. Um, I'm employed by Asia's Ministries. And I have a, a wage. And it's really weird. <laughs> and my soul doesn't like it. Because <laughs> my soul now looks at my wage and thinks, oh, I can or I can't, according to that wage. Mm. And 10 years of learning just went out the window because your brain compartmentalizes. And when I got to America in November, I instantly felt fear and the need to do something. And very practical things start coming to me. Americans give to donations because my my wage will be paid off a donation to a ministry of which I get a set wage. And they give in December. I'm here in November. I need to put out a series of teachings in December so everyone knows I'm here and get that money in the end of the year to catch on at the end of the year. And I'm sitting there and like, I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> which which is fine to do, but what's your motivation? My motivation was fear of death, fear of lack. Because a new thing, like go to like Egypt with no money, like I've done that, landed in Egypt without, I had $70, I landed in Egypt. Like that's okay. But do I believe that God will raise the funds to pay for a wage and tax and whatever comes to that? Or like I didn't. Like it's just it's like it clicked into a different thing, and like like I couldn't understand God's faithfulness in uh, in this area where I need a legislative uh, rule you have to comply to American corporate law. <laughs> I could do the whole walk around the earth, but could I pay the tax man? <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> and, my, and the Alabama employee fees, I didn't believe it. And so I, I just had to put it aside and said, no, I'm not. This has to be you. Because that's wise. Maybe it's very wise for ministry to do that. But for me, it wasn't from choice. It was from fear. I knew that. So I just let it go. And yeah. So this is my first. Uh, I got here in November. And so I'm returning into, I'm returning to ministering. Uh, and this is the first, This you're the first, guys. <laughs> Off the rink. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, so, we, that's the answer, Josh. You asked the question like, what have you learned in that time? Yeah, that's what I've learned. Uh, I'm learning to apply it in all situations because having no money, which is areas of your soul, provide the govern hundreds of millions of dollars, like my friend's doing, <laughs> they will also challenge different areas of your soul. <laughs> And in some ways, having no money to believe God is easier to obey God than with $100 million. Because if I've got no money and God says, go to Japan, well, it has to be God. If I've got $100 million, I could fly first class to Japan and stay in the Tokyo Hyatt and top floor and <laughs> come home. I don't need God mission. And so uh, being faithful to his word and provision through uh a promise uh, that he is your provision. And the wealth that God adds, adds no sorrow. We get by arm of flesh, it will bring death in some some way, uh, which is not to say it don't work, like I'm an employee now, whatever, like it's fine, start a business. But from, Paul says, from, by grace, work harder than you all. So from this grace, hey, you can do 18-hour days on your home project, like as long as it's from rest, from the promise. And you have the ability to have free choice. So if God says, come away, you're going to, for a day, you go, hang on, I'm trading. And God says, no, no, come for a day. Like that word is your provision, not the 24 hours you missed trading. And so you need that choice to be able to follow the word because sons of God live by the word of God, are led by the spirit. And that's uh, that's what maturity is, being led by the spirit because the spirit's doing what heaven's doing. So if you do what heaven's doing, you're doing what the father's doing. That's what a mature son does, looks like the father. And so this fear of death has to be broken. So I landed here, now I had compliance rules. I freaked a little. And you know, we had to pay a lawyer to set it up and you know, an accountant to set it up. And like, that's all money. And you know, like I've never I've been out of this system. I'm trained as an uh I did, I did a commerce degree, which is your business degree. I worked as an accountant, so that's my background. And I had to kill it all. <laughs> And I tried to come back. I was like, I couldn't even do like a simple spreadsheet or a simple like debit and credit. I was like, what is this? <laughs> so um business or you know, wandering the earth and don't you know, don't take an extra jacket and don't take a um purse, or you know, building a multinational corporation that has uh you know 10,000 employees. It's the same thing. Your relationship with your father, your undoing Eden. That is God good to you? Is God good? Did he really say? If he is that, say, well, then prove it. Why isn't the evidence in your faith? Like reach out with your arm and turn this into bread or jump off this or whatever. And Jesus is like, it is written. The word does the work. The word fights all your battles. And you just have to be good soil. Good soil says God is good. That's just holding. Hold, hold, hold. You know, and uh, and you get to a place where, uh, you know, uh, the the three guys said, you know, God's going to save us. If he doesn't save us, he's still God. I'm like, God's faithful to his word, you know, and if I don't see it, I can't explain that, that fact I'm living in. But the truth is that's who he is. That's a death and resurrection. You're you're living, being a human from survival and going by a promise, which is what Adam and Eve should have done in the first place. Yeah, and that's what that's what second Adam did went by a promise, and that's what made him a, uh, a son. I mean, was this was the son? You know what I'm saying? But that's what a mature son does. Yeah, yeah. All right. So good. So good. Uh, Chris, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap this session right here. But I just want to say thank you so much 
for sharing so much of who you are and who you are as a son and yeah. the uh the real and not just the fluffy stuff <laughs> because i think that's what um that's what people need you know what i mean like there there is struggle in some of this and there is discipline and learning how to be a son and settling into that and um continued stretching and i just i honor you for everything you've done and everything you've shared with us and with our listeners and i just really appreciate you thank you yeah yeah well uh sons is what we are what we will become we don't know but um being a good christian is not going to cut it anymore uh but if you're a son then it doesn't matter what happens in the world your security is in heaven and all you want to do what you see the father doing yeah yeah good thank you very much so yeah, good so good thank you uh, so I have more questions for you, but we're going to save this for the bonus content. So if you're listening, um, you got to become a member and you can get access to all of the bonus content with Chris, our other guests, and, um, even expanded conversations from what we're doing. But, um, until next time, we'll see ya. See ya. Hey, thanks for listening. Keep up with us along this journey by liking, subscribing, and becoming a member through YouTube. Members get exclusive access to bonus content with our guests, deeper dives into topics, and a look into other projects. We're glad to have you here. See you next time.